All right, people, the iOS 12 public beta is finally out there. And for a lot of you, that means you're about to get your very first taste of what Apple's vision of its smartphone software should look like in 2018. Before we go any further, there are a couple things you should keep in mind. Yes, this is still a beta, so while I haven't run into any deal-breaking bugs, you might, so don't install this on a device you plan to use on a daily basis. And beyond that, some of the features that you might have really been looking forward to, like shortcuts for me, are just not quite ready yet. But with all that said, there's a lot to dig into here, so let's take a closer look. First off, let's talk about performance. iOS 12 is really kind of meant to give older devices, especially a big boost in performance. That's evidenced by the fact that this software update is compatible with iPhones and iPads as early as the iPhone 5S and the iPad mini 2. These are devices from 2013. These are five year old phones. If you're still using them, you probably need this extra boost in performance. I've not tested the software on either of these devices yet because I need to find some. But from what I've heard from people who have, the experience actually has been really positive. I've been doing most of my testing on an iPhone 10 running iOS 12 and even compared to an iPhone 10 running iOS 11.4, there's a slight performance boost. Launching apps, opening share sheets, things like that do occur just a bit quicker on the iPhone running iOS 12. I don't know that you'll be over the moon over this pretty minor lift in performance, but it goes to show you how much optimization is happening. Even compared to a device running what is otherwise the latest software, there's a pretty decent lift in performance. There are also some new ways to express yourself, which are sort of interesting. Animoji are back, obviously. There are now four new ones, including a koala and a Tyrannosaurus Rex, because who among us didn't really want those? But you're probably here because you want to know about Memoji. These are Animoji based off of your own face, and unlike Samsung's AR emoji, it's not like Apple's taking a picture and sort of creating an Animoji based off of that. You're doing the whole thing yourself, and it is a very in-depth process, though maybe not as in-depth as I would have liked. You have multiple options for hair and for skin tone and for nose and facial features, but the ultimate result kind of looks like this cartoony Pixar-like avatar of you, and that's arguably not a bad thing. I do kind of wish there was a little more granularity in how you could place facial features on your virtual face. I kind of miss the Nintendo Wii style approach where you've got really fine focus on where everything goes, which ultimately leads to an avatar that looks way more like you, or in my case, the monstrosities I used to spend hours making. That focus on Animoji is actually really interesting because you can now apply Animoji masks that sort of stick on your face while you're on FaceTime calls. And bear in mind, you can now have up to 32 people on a FaceTime call, so you're probably gonna see a lot of these really, really soon. You can also gussy up images that you send via iMessage with a new set of effects, which are sort of cool, but generally not that helpful. By the way, you can use those effects in your live video calls as well. You can stick arrows to your head just because, I don't know, have a great time, who knows. The one thing I don't like about the new approach to messages is that with iOS 11, there was a camera button. You could hit that and you could either take a photo or select a photo from your camera roll to send. Now you have to use a specific separate iPhotos app in the iMessage tray. So kind of getting used to that, I haven't really gotten there yet. With iOS 12, Apple's also really trying to take more of your digital well-being into account. And whether or not any of these tools that they provide are ultimately helpful for you is not up to anyone but you. I think it's just nice to have those tools. Notifications, for example, are now grouped by apps. So instead of just thumbing through this crazy long stream of notifications, you now have separate clusters for you to jump into when you know you have a Gmail or an iMessage coming in that you really need to look at. It's also easier to manage how those notifications reveal themselves. So if you want something to pop up on your phone right when it happens, cool, you can do that. Otherwise, you can set certain applications to set notifications that just go straight into the notification center. You don't have to see them if you know the app they're coming from isn't really important to you. Do Not Disturb has actually gotten some new changes as well, and I've actually found that maybe more helpful than anything. You can now actually access more options from the control center, allowing you to set Do Not Disturb for an hour, for the end of the day, or for whenever you leave your current location, which is great because I spend a lot of time in bars and movie theaters and I really don't want my phone blowing up while I'm out with my friends. There's also Do Not Disturb during bedtime, which is a nice little touch. It mutes all notifications coming in between hours you set in the middle of the night. And once you wake up, iOS sort of eases you into the day. It doesn't show you all of your notifications at once. It gives you this nice sort of welcome screen with a weather forecast and then dumps you back into all of the stuff you have to deal with for the next day. And then there's screen time, which is Apple's attempt to give you the data you might need to curb your smartphone addiction. Basically speaking, once you have this set up, 
iOS will give you a breakdown of how much time you spend in apps in certain categories like social media or reference or things like that and allow you to drill down and figure out, well, maybe I'm spending too much time on Facebook or Snapchat. You can limit the amount of time you spend in these apps by those genres or by specific apps. So if you know you spend way too much time on Twitter and who among us does not these days, you can actually limit yourself to, say, an hour and give yourself a little extra sanity for the day. Now, this is obviously a pretty big update. We've hit a lot of the big stuff already, but there are some little things that we haven't really spent a ton of time with that I think are still worth pointing out. For one, some apps have gotten some pretty interesting redesigns. Apple Books, formerly known as iBooks, now has more of a focus on getting you to buy books and audiobooks, so it's sort of a bit in line with the App Store. The new stock app gives you the ability to look at live price charts for your stocks, in addition to reading news from Apple News, and Apple News, for that matter, has a bit of a redesign itself. While the complex Siri shortcuts that Apple showed off at its WWDC keynote aren't quite ready yet, the app is just not in the App Store free to use, you can get a taste of it now by setting up vocal shortcuts for certain actions. So for example, I like to read Apple News and when I want to read highlighted stuff for me, I can say Siri, news me, and it gives me exactly what I'm looking for. What else? Ah, iPhone 10, better gestures. Instead of having to swipe up and hold on an app card while you're trying to dismiss it, once you jump into that multitasking view, you can just swipe up, it's gone. It's much cleaner. This is the way it should have been from the beginning. Thank you, finally. There are also some really interesting new security features in iOS 12, but I haven't been able to try most of them. The one I was looking forward to the most, the ability for Safari to block social buttons on websites, doesn't seem to work. I still see them all over the place. That said, if you want to set up a secondary Face ID for somebody else you'd like to have access to your phone, or, I don't know, a different look, if you look that different day to day, cool, you can now finally do that. There's also the ability to disable USB connections for the iPhone or iPad once it's been locked for an hour. This seems like it's a great way to keep law enforcement out of your phone, and I don't really have anything to hide, but if you do, or if you just hate the idea of someone being able to access your stuff like that without your consent, this is a setting you're definitely gonna wanna have on. Obviously, there's still a lot to dig into in this update, and personally, I can't wait to throw this public beta on every old iPhone and iPad that I have just to see how much better that they run. If you've got an experience with iOS 12 you'd like to share, please let us know. But in the meantime, stick around for more coverage here from Engadget.